Thank you, choir, and thank you, praise team, who are half up in the choir and half down. You guys also gave up your morning practice this morning so we could cheer on the team, which is awesome, all for a good cause. I think it's kind of funny that uh, the scripture for this week, which was chosen long before Canada made it to the gold medal round, was the love your enemies. <laughs> although, uh, although playing Sweden doesn't quite feel so. I mean, you, 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 can't, you can't hate a country that produces IKEA. You can be <laughs> insanely frustrated with Sweden. As we, you know, have you ever seen those? You've, you've done the IKEA thing, right? Frustrated, maybe, but not enemies, no. But I do love the irony. I think it's, it's great. It was a little more of a relaxed game uh, than some games. You know, Pastor Dave, during a lot of uh, hockey games, or especially football, as in soccer games, he can't even sit still. I mean, he paces back and forth. I, I figure it was your sermon last week on handling stress that just made all the difference in the world. This was a calm, cool, relaxed play all week even. I'm sure you were just relaxed during all the games this week, right, Dave? If you missed that one, there are copies uh, at, on the back table as well as uh, I think you can catch that one on the web. So, uh, but, uh, but I do find the whole hockey thing just... Uh, I, I've been a hockey mom for a year and a half now. It's a, it's a new thing for me. But I, I find it amazing, like in my daughter Petra is in the Brockville Braves Novice uh, League C3. And uh, sometimes, holy cow, you'd swear it was the gold medal game and that some in global injustice had happened on the rink the way that, you know, the parents just absolutely lose it. And I've seen parents kicked out of the game for it. I mean, we're talking a game with seven-year-olds, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't get it, except... Except I get it when my kid gets an elbow to the head and the ref deliberately ignores it. And then I'm like, what the heck? You know, you, what are you doing, ref? We Canadians, were so darn polite and nice. Except when it comes to hockey. Except when it comes to our kid. Then everything changes. Watch out. You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy but I say to you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven for if you love those who love you what reward do you have do not even tax collectors do the same and if you greet only your brothers and sisters what more are you doing than others do not even the Gentiles do the same be perfect therefore as your heavenly father is perfect we have a saying around this church that goes, God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. It's not a Wall Street original. We got it from somewhere. We liked it. We adopted it. It fits us. The first part of that, God loves you just the way you are, is all about grace. You're welcome. No matter who you are, where you've come from, what you've done, you're welcome in this church. And you're welcome in the kingdom of God. Grace. Um, it is so easy to become a Christian. All you need to do is say a little prayer, asking Jesus to come into your life, and just say, look, I want to follow you, Jesus. I know I'm not perfect, but I want to follow you. A little prayer will, uh, you can be a Christian in, a, in an instant. It's easy. But living like a Christian, being a Christian is a whole different matter. That's the second part of that. God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. That's the part of growing up. It's kind of like having children. Getting pregnant, for the most part, is pretty easy. Raising those kids, that's the hard part. When we decide to follow Jesus, it's like we're being born again for the second time. That term born again wasn't invented in the 60s. Jesus said it to a guy named Nicodemus that you have to be born again. That part's not so hard. It's the growing up. It's that being different because you're a Christ Christian that is different. You are not perfect. And some days and at some times in your life, you're a total mess. And that's fine. 
but you can't stay there. When you decide to follow, you need to work on maturing your faith. Following Jesus should change you. Last Sunday night, uh, Louie spoke at our evening service. Wave, Louie. <laughs> and uh, it was a, Louis gave a testimony of his life, told the story of his life. And many of you know that Louis come from a background of just like incredible addiction. And uh, he talked about how, um, I mean, Louis, he's come so far in the last, uh, he's been clean and sober for, for two years now which is awesome, and, and if you'd heard this. <laughs> coming from, uh, you know, the, the life he led in, in, in Toronto to what it is today is, is nothing short of miraculous, and I, what? Oh, London. Ah, London, Toronto, down the 401 somewhere, right? <laughs> no, I'm choking. <laughs> <laughs> you probably still vote cheer for the Leafs, so really, what does it matter? <laughs> Um, uh, but, it, you know, it's by the grace of God that Louis is with us today, as well as he talked about um, AA and, and the hard work that he's put into his recovery, working the steps, the 12 steps of AA. And, and he told us last Sunday that everything in his life needed to change. Uh, it's, it's amazing that you're alive today and, and with us. And it's by the grace of God, but it's also through incredibly hard work. And Louis knows that that hard work continues, that he's not out of the woods, and, and maybe never will be out of the woods, that this life of recovery is needing to take one step and one step and continuing that hard work. Um, you have to keep changing and keep moving forward. So here's my question to those of you who are, call yourselves Christian, are you changing? Are you getting better? Are you forgiving others more often? Because if you're not changing yourself, you really have no hope of making a difference and changing the world around you. And maybe that's the problem with many Christians we look at Jesus' words and we think, oh, isn't that nice? Love your enemies. Isn't that nice? But we don't actually take the words seriously. Jesus wasn't an impractical idealist. He meant what he said. Let me put this clearly. If you love and do good only to those people in the world that you like, who speak the same language as you, who hold the same values as you, who vote the same way that you did, you do, and ignore everyone else, or maybe even secretly despise everyone else. You may be a nice person. You may be, in some ways, a good person, a responsible person, but you are not a follower of Jesus. When you decide to follow Jesus, your love has to extend beyond boundaries, beyond the boundaries of your comfort zones. Here's a new f news flash. Loving people you don't like isn't easy. Loving your enemy is not a feeling, it's a choice. It won't happen if you wait for some euphoric Christian kumbaya thing to come floating down upon you, where you just all of a sudden take on this glow and, oh, I just love the world. That's not the way it works. When you decide to follow, you have to commit to living differently, and you have to start acting on that commitment. The action and the commitment comes before the feeling. Although that's the cool thing, is that often when you do commit and take a step forward in action, the feeling will follow. Practicing this radical love will change you, and it also has the great potential to change the world. What does it look like? Well, here's an example that I liked 
We're coming up to a year um, ago that the bombs were set off at the Boston Marathon. Tamerlan Tsarnaev was the older of the two brothers who set those bombs in the marathon. And he's the one who died in the process of the police chase. Well, after that tragedy, no cemetery was willing to allow his body to be buried. No one wanted his body in their town, in their cemetery. Martha Mullen, a Christian, felt convicted to respond. She said she was in Starbucks when she heard an, a radio news report about the difficulty of finding a burial spot for Tsarnev. My first thought, she said, was Jesus said, love your enemies. Then she had an epiphany. I thought someone ought to do something about this, and I am someone. So Mullen, who's a mental health counselor um, in private practice, she started sending out emails to various faith communities uh, to see what could be done. She finally heard back from Islamic Funeral Services of Virginia, who arranged for a funeral plot at the Al Barzak Cemetery. She said it was an interfaith effort. She's a member of the United Methodist Church and she was motivated by her own faith and she had the support of her church and her pastor. One NPR um, reporter asked her why she, who is like a complete stranger to that family, would get involved especially when she had potential to be a target, and she was a major target for angry protesters. And Martha answered, it made me think of Jesus' words, love your enemies. I felt that Tamerlan was being maligned probably because he was Muslim. And Jesus tells us too in the parable of the Good Samaritan, love your neighbor as yourself. And she says, your neighbor is not just someone who you get along with, but someone who is alien to you. If I'm gonna live my faith, then I'm going to do that which is uncomfortable and not necessarily what's comfortable. I feel like it was the right thing and it's important to be true to the principles of your faith. As I say, she has been the target of a, a lot of angry backlash and she says, I can't pretend that it hasn't been difficult to be reviled and maligned. But any time you can reach across the divide and work with people that are not like you, that's what God calls us to do. Now, I tried to find, you know, sort of what difference this made, whether the parents had made any comments, but uh, as you can imagine, they probably aren't too keen to be in the media. So it's hard to know what difference it made. But I believe that no act of love goes out into the world without making some kind of a difference. And sometimes we see the difference that makes, and, and sometimes we don't. Nevertheless, it makes a difference. There are people out there that you don't like. There are people out there who don't like you. Maybe because of something you've said or done. Maybe just because of who you are, how you look, how you behave. Always there are opportunities. Often there are opportunities to respond to someone who has mistreated you, who has... Um, maybe gossiped about you or done something. And when those opportunities arrive, you ha arise, you have a choice. You can respond with an eye for an eye, with, with gossip, with anger, with, I think the Canadian favorite is the passive aggression, right? That's, that's our national pastime, is not the aggression, but the passive aggression. Or outright violence. Or, or the other side, you can resign yourself and give in and tell yourself that you're no good, that you deserve to be treated this way. You can become the victim. Fight or flight, right? Those are the two choices. Jesus says there's another way. You can respond with the power of love, which is neither being the victim nor getting even. Martin Luther King Jr. understood this very well. Dr. King said he would preach on this topic of love your enemies at least once a year because it was so important and so difficult for us to understand. Or maybe we sort of get it here 
but it's so hard for it to drop down into our hearts and actually make a difference. Here are some of the words that he preached at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama on the 17th of November, 1957. We must discover the power of love, the power, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make of this old world a new world. We will be able to make men better. Love is the only way Jesus discovered that. So this morning as I look into your eyes and into the eyes of all of my brothers in Alabama and all over America and over the world, I say to you, I love you. I would rather die than hate you. And I'm foolish enough to believe that through the power of this love somewhere, men of the most recalcitrant bent will be transformed. And then we will be in God's kingdom. We will be able to matriculate into the university of eternal life because we had the power to love our enemies, to bless those persons that cursed us, to even decide to be good to those persons who hated us, and we even prayed for those persons who despitefully used us. He's great. I, I could have preached his whole sermon, but he preaches a little longer than I do, so I thought I'd... Uh, go with my own but I love that in the next uh, have you got that image there Richard the the this uh, his quote darkness cannot drive out darkness only light can do that hate cannot drive out hate only love can do that if you have decided to follow Jesus then it's time for you to let the old you die it's time to grow up and to live like Jesus. That's what I loved about the message version of our scripture this morning. It goes, in a word, what I'm saying to you is grow up. Your kingdom subjects. Now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and creatively towards others the way God lives towards you. It's not easy. It's not easy. But as you live like it, you will change. And as you change, the world around you will change. Believe in the power of love, in the way that Jesus taught. And we will see this community and this world become a better place. Thanks be to God. Amen.